that the Green Party uh, was a Green Party endorsed candidate during the last election cycle. Also a member of uh, CUAPB as well as the other uh, social and economic justice groups that are here. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, as I alluded to earlier, this is the most important social, economic justice, racial justice issue of our time. Uh, primarily with what happened in Ferguson with uh, Officer Darren Wilson with him uh, not being charged uh, for the murder of Michael Brown and also in recent developments with uh, with Eric Gardner as well too. So um, we don't want to forget about the uh, people in, in the great state of Minnesota who've lost their lives to uh, police brutality. Um, Terrence Franklin, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Abuka Sanders was killed, uh, murdered by the police back in uh, 2000. Um, we went to high school together and uh, he was brutally uh, murdered by the police, shot in his car in an, in an alley. So I am excited, I'm ecstatic to have this conversation and I'm excited for the panelists that we have here. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I wanna welcome you all again uh, to this conversation about uh, police brutality, police accountability, and how they, the tactics they use to uh, kill with impunity. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our panel here. We have uh, Jess Sundin here with uh, the Anti-War Committee. And I have uh, Miss Betty, Miss Betty Smith here, whose son was murdered by Minneapolis Police Department. We have law professor uh, Peter Erlinger. And uh, we have uh, Dave Bicking here at the end. And so, um, so Peter Erlinger will give us a legal overview of the grand jury and other tricks that are used um, by the system and by those uh, who abuse their power. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thanks. Uh, All right, let's give him a welcome. Uh, I asked for uh, special dispensation to go first because I had an operation <laughs> Friday and uh, I'm uh, not in such great shape, so I may have to uh, leave before the program is over, so I hope you forgive me. Uh, I also wanted to give a uh, shout out to Communities uh, United uh, Against Police. They're a member of what's called the National Police Accountability Project, um, which is part of the National Lawyers Guild. And I was the national president of the National Lawyers Guild uh, 20 years ago when the National Police Accountability Project was founded. And so I'm actually the founder, uh, along with Jim Lafferty, of the National Police Accountability Project 20 years ago. And the reason we started it was because police accountability cases are a bitch. They're really hard to win. And so we figured out that if we could get a group of lawyers together who were willing to do these cases and hook them up with each other, it would be a little bit easier if lawyers around the country and community groups around the country could get to know each other and share resources uh, and that they could work with people who are uh, legal observers, the green hats you've seen, right? All of that was a conscious plan that Jim Lafferty and I started 20 years ago so that Communities United Against Police Brutality and the National Police Accountability Project and the legal observers could all work together with people in the streets to keep people in the streets and to make sure that there were some legal resources necessary in spite of the really difficult problems of suing the police and defending people. So the fact that we're here tonight is like a closing of the circle um, that started 20 years ago. So I, I really want to thank you guys for being here because this is, it's like uh, the fruition of a dream that, that we cooked up and it's worked because it hasn't stopped the problem but there are people fighting the problem all over the place and there are comrades in the legal profession who are able to do it a whole lot better now because there are people in the community and other people who are part of the legal working community uh, who are making common cause together. So um, this is, uh, uh, it's like, you know, 
um, the people united will never be defeated, you know? <laughs> and so um, it's a really happy moment. Um, what I wanted to talk about, though, was the idea that the police and organized law enforcement have always played the role, as well as the legal system, has always played the role of keeping the powerless powerless and using state power to make sure that those who have power keep it. They're hired by those who have power to keep things exactly as they are. That's true of every portion of the legal prosecution system. It's not a legal justice system. It's a legal prosecution system out of which sometimes justice falls, uh, largely by mistake. And um, we should get used to thinking of it that way, both domestically and internationally. We see internationally powerful nations never get prosecuted for their crimes. We have an international criminal court where only black African leaders end up in the court uh, those who make up weapons of mass destruction that were not true never are going to see those courts. It happens internationally, it happens domestically. So we have to be realistic that when we go into the legal system, we are going into their turf on their system using rules that they've created, and it's been that way ever since the pharaohs. That is the nature of the system with which we're dealing. Now the question is, how can we win, how can we even play the game on their turf? Well, um, Frederick Douglass you know, said, of course, that those who want justice without struggle are like those who want the crops to grow without the rain. Uh, uh, this is a struggle, and it's a lifelong struggle. It will not change unless the struggle is also in the streets. One of the great things that Obama taught us was that a president who considers himself African American still is a president for Wall Street, not for us. If a freedom, uh, if if a a female president gets elected. Uh, will remind everybody that Margaret Thatcher has already taught us what that's like. Right? Uh, this is a question of power versus lack of power. Now, the thing that's unusual right now is that people are realizing that the grand jury can be manipulated. Now, the grand jury was originally put into our Constitution as a way to stop the abuse of government power. It's in the Fifth Amendment because until um, in England, the king was always able to decide who was going to be prosecuted. And the grand jury was a way of letting ordinary citizens decide who was going to be prosecuted. But that was at a time when there were no professional prosecutors, there were no professional police, if there was going to be a prosecution in a particular town, there was an elected sheriff, and a judge would come around every so often, and a grand jury of ordinary citizens was in panel to figure out what crimes had been committed since the last time the uh, judge was in town, and the citizens would decide who was going to be charged criminally. And our Constitution had written into it the idea that citizens do the charging in federal cases, not the government. It was a wonderful, wonderful idea. But then things changed in an industrial society. It was no longer a small agricultural town that we had. We now had big cities. Full time, in fact, Scotland Yard was the first full time police department that existed in the 1840s. But now we have professional prosecutors, professional police departments, and now the grand jury doesn't know what went on in town anymore. And now the grand jury takes whatever information they're given by the prosecutor and by the police. And now, as a, 
Uh, Chief Justice in New York said a, uh, a uh, grand jury uh, can, uh, will indict a ham sandwich if that's what the prosecutor wants. Or a grand jury will not uh, indict Caligula if the prosecution, uh, prosecutor doesn't want it to happen. The problem is there's a conflict of interest whenever the prosecutors who must depend on the police for their job are asked to prosecute the same police. There should never be a prosecutor asked to prosecute the police that the prosecutor has to work with, ever, grand jury or not. The truth is that unless a prosecutor is going to ask for first degree murder in Minnesota, for example, the prosecutor doesn't need a grand jury. Second degree murder or anything else, manslaughter, whatever, could be charged without a grand jury in Minnesota. So as soon as you see a grand jury being impaneled in Minnesota, you know that prosecutor is trying to avoid responsibility for making the decision. No question. In other jurisdictions, the law is a bit different, but it means that the prosecutor can then point, say, oh, the grand jury made the decision, I didn't. And the grand jury is only going to make the decision that the prosecutor uh, wants them to make because the prosecutor can either give them so much information they can't deal with it or so little information they can't possibly make a decision. But in either case, a prosecutor that's asked to make a decision about prosecuting a cop that that prosecutor has to deal with every day for their job is a non-starter. So cops should never be prosecuted by the prosecutors they have to work with. Should be prosecuted by some prosecutor from another part of the state or from another state or by the attorney general in the state. Someone who's an elected official that can be held to account by the people in the state if the prosecutor doesn't do what the people of the state think they should do. Right? And then the question of the grand jury is how to get the grand jury back to what it was supposed to have been, which is a body of the people deciding who should be prosecuted. And that's going to require a whole lot more thought. But what we do have now is a situation where we have um, uh, the, uh, the fox guarding the hen house, and we have a situation where it's quite clear that the police and the prosecutors are doing what they've been hired to do, which is protecting power and making sure that those of us who don't have power um, are intimidated by the law enforcement system that we have to deal with every day. And you add on top of that the racism in the society uh, more generally and the racism that exists um, in uh, police departments particularly. And what we have is a system that has got to be changed, uh, but we also learned in our last presidential elections that it's not going to happen just in the ballot box. Um, we're going to have to do what people have been doing for the last six, eight months is we're going to have to take it to the streets, which people have been doing, and they're learning that lesson, uh, I hope. But it's an ongoing struggle that probably is a lifetime struggle. Thanks. All right, next uh, we have uh, Ron Edwards here, and he's been a longtime police accountability and racial justice advocate, and uh, he's going to provide us with the uh, historical content of uh, police brutality. Thank you. That was a gracious introduction for somebody that got here late. <laughs> but um, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk in regards to the subject matter. You know, grand juries, <clears throat> do they work? <laughs> Don't they work? Are they biased? Grand juries, I've had the opportunity as an activist, civil rights, all those things, mm -hmm. to have appeared before two grand juries in my lifetime, having nothing to do with me uh, as a bad colored guy or anything like that, but having to do in both situations with issues involving police officers, but in both cases they were black police officers. One uh, was acquitted, the other one was indicted. One of the things that I found very interesting, that means it really hasn't changed, is that the appearances were 10 years apart. And yet, in going before both of these grand juries, I, I heard the professor talk in terms of what the criteria should be with respect to citizen participation. But in that 10-year period, uh, the grand jury looked the same both times, all white. But I want to share a piece of history with you because I've heard a lot of people talking about grand juries in the history. There was only one occasion 
to the best of any historical uh, research, uh, that a grand jury in Minnesota came close to indicting a white police officer for killing an unarmed African American. And uh, that was in 1973, and it, it was uh, as an outgrowth of the death of the son of a man who had just retired as the civil rights director for the city of Minneapolis, Robert Benford. It was his son, Eric Benford, uh, who was in the United States Army, was home on leave, and in fact, in a couple days was to have returned uh, to Vietnam uh, to serve his country and to protect and defend the institutions of this great nation. Eric Benford was gunned down by an Egan police officer, uh, but the grand jury, which had an exceptional number of African Americans, three, uh, <clears throat> came within one vote of indicting that, that police officer. That's the closest they ever came, <laughs> and my sense is it's the closest they ever will come in this city uh, and in this county. By the way, that was a federal grand jury, and the U.S. attorney at that time was a man by the name of Robert Renner, who later became a sitting federal judge. I had a good relationship with him because he presided over the <clears throat> supervision of the Minneapolis Fire Department uh, in a 20-year battle to integrate that department, if you will. But in the case of Eric Benford, that's the closest we've ever come. They were one short, one vote short, three African Americans on that panel. And I'll just say this, one of the reasons that I was very familiar with the case is that two of them were both personal friends of mine and also served on the Urban League board with me. The third was an African American woman from St. Paul. Uh, I don't think the number of, on the federal grand jury has probably ever exceeded five at best. And the Hennepin County grand jury, I do remember about 15 years ago, we had allegedly six African Americans or people of color on the grand jury. So. The whole issue of how you actually are selected, I assume that that's already been talked about by the panel, uh, is a process that certainly needs to be reviewed. But in conclusion, I always will be concerned and wonder about what it is that will really take a grand jury, which will never be in this state comprised of those who are at least half of the same racial background as the defendant in these cases of African Americans being killed by the police. Let me also say this in closing, because people get confused. There have been, in the history of this state, three shootings on unarmed African Americans by African American law enforcement officers. Three. Uh, the last one was really about 15 years ago, but during a 10-year period, we seem to have an epidemic. We had one in St. Paul, two in Minneapolis. We had Griffin in St. Paul, we had Rhodes in Minneapolis, and we had Work Call in Minneapolis. So contrary to what some say, unfortunately, African-American law enforcement officers have been involved in very questionable shootings. And by the way, all three of the African-Americans who expired were unarmed. So we, we must take equal consideration with regards to <clears throat> what I would identify as the culture of law enforcement in this country. No matter what color you are in that uniform, sometimes the culture catches you up to the extent that you will deny your own. So, thank you. Okay, next we're going to hear from Betty Smith, whose son was murdered by the Minneapolis Police Department. And you're going to hear from her. This is something that's happening in the African American community almost on a very regular basis where our youth and, um, and our men are being targeted by police um, who are abusing their powers and subsequently we're being imprisoned or even dying at alarming rates. My son was 24. Um, he had a 10 week old child. He was already had a legal suit going against a certain police officer for they tried to give him his friend a ticket for jaywalking, so the brutality suit was already in process. They were set to go to court November the 18th, and they, this policeman had been notified of that. My son had another altercation with this same policeman on December the 8th of 2008. Um, I don't want to go into the details. It's gross. My son was tased, beaten, and choked. And his 
step was to rule the homicide by our medical examiner here. But as Mr. Erling says, the powers that be use their powers so we don't get, so they hope we will not do it and not get any justice. I am still taking my child's case through the court system. We're in, still in that process. And yes, it's been six years, but we're, I am still fighting it and running against all the, yeah. it's very frustrating because as Mr. Rington, they have the knowledge, they have the rules, they twist everything. When you compare the cases, the police say what they need to say, as Mr. Edwards related to, every year is the same thing. No matter which child, who's killed, the police have the same story. They do cover for each other. What we need to do is stay together as a community, as a city, because that is the only way anything will be changed. Um, we do have to take it to the streets. I was very silent at first, but of course I had to grieve because that's a horrible way to know my child was murdered. Um, out of, I think, just revenge because you could. I will give you some insight when I say how the courts work. At one of the, one of the times when we were in court, the prosecutors wanted to make our children out to be animals. There were five policemen, five nice size white policemen trying to say that they could not apprehend one healthy sized black man. And it doesn't take all of that. And then our city wants to still say that's not brutality unless we stand up as individuals and not sit back and wait until it's your child. They will continue to do this. If I think by targeting our young black men is a way of just eliminating our race. And we need to take a look at that. They're not murdering our older black men. It's the young black men, whatever they can stop them for. I am a nurse in a K-8 school. Yesterday, one of my students came in. He needed ice for his wrist. I said, what happened? And he said he, it was after curfew, so he was locked out of his house and was on his way down the street to his grandmother's house. The police stopped him. <coughs> he and another young man walking. They stopped them. They put the handcuffs on this child. What is that saying to our young black men? You're trying to intimidate them from the very beginning. He was still scared when he came the next day to get ice because his wrist hurt. And I'm still trying to, all I told him was stay off the street. Don't let curfew catch you out there. It's not okay that someone else was with him. Someone else was with Michael Brown when he got murdered too. It doesn't take all those bullets and certainly not one to the head to kill, to stop anyone. And as long as we as a people allow the police to say, I fear for my life, without looking at what they have done, what the brutality of it is, not focus on what the media is telling you that this person was accused of, because we weren't there. But you can rest for sure the media is trying to make it that they were really doing something. And if this person was doing what they said, we need to stand up as a people and say there is no reason to murder a child, a young man. We have to stop. We've elected these people, given them the right, and that's what we're doing when we don't band together, do not show up at court, do not take it to the streets, do not do everything you can to get your voice out that this is not right. And not listen to everything the media is telling you because I can tell you they twist it. I ask people from my perspective, focus on not what we've been told that person did. We were not there. Focus on what evidence we see after the fact. It does not take nine bullets to kill anyone. If you are that afraid of one individual, you should not be a police. I think we as a people need to stand up and say those things. Marching is fine, but we need to use our voices. We need to attack what the police are telling us. We need to attack what they're sure you have to work with them. I work with other nurses. If I see a nurse stealing something, I'm still going to tell. I still got to work with her, but I am going to still report her. Because the medication she was taking is not hers. The equipment she's taking is not hers. She's denying some other patient. I'm not going to not say something just because I have to work with her. If I open my mouth and say something, I may not have to work with her if I continue it because she will be eliminated. But that's because you say something. 
the meetings are fine, the, the talking is fine, but we have to have action. We have to yes. challenge the police yes. when yes. they say, oh, he was coming at me like an animal. You have been trained. The, uh, Channel 9 did a video uh, a story where they showed the tasers and how the police are, were tasing a dog and thought it was funny that that dog was jumping. It was not funny for my son laying in the snow and getting tased. There was no reason for that. You already apprehended this young man. There was no reason for him to be hit in the back with a shotgun. You've already got him down. There was no reason for him to be choked until he couldn't breathe. You already have him in custody. And that is what I am fighting. And that is why I say my things when I'm asked to, tell people to think about it. We have to challenge the system. We have to challenge the system as a group, yes. not one or two people, because until we challenge the system, it will stay the same, and God forbid that it's your child, because that is one of the worst things anyone could get a phone call for or see it on the news. They are not very nice to you, and they turn the story around as though one child, one man, well, as a parent you call him a child, he's a grown man, can do that much harm. I am still fighting, and as I say, if these police did not have a button popped off of a shirt, not a scratch on his face, it didn't take all of that brutality. That was excess. And I get enough people that uh, to go along with that, you know, and, but the county is doing everything it can to keep me from getting to a trial. Um, I'm still going, I still pay and get on through. Right now we're at a standstill because the county prosecutors have offered me a ultimatum. If you don't know, if you lose a case, they can charge you for all of the money for making oh. the things. Um, so they've informed me that if I continue with this suit, which is to take it to the Supreme Court, I'm going to and we lose, they will charge me, and I said, you can't get blood from a tomato. Because we're going forward. I'm not going to shut up. And if it, with that said, all I can say, all I can tell anyone is that we all need to band together. Anyone you can get. We need to show up at these court appearances when we see them. We need to voice our opinions wherever you possibly can because it is political. The people in our city who should be helping us out, as he said, the police, police, and the police, our mayors and other <coughs> politicians also have their hands in their pocket and they're all taking care of each other. Yes. While yes. they can only do that because at some point they fooled us and we voted for them and got them in office. So we have to take another look at what we're doing when we vote them in and get them in, how are we gonna get them out? How are we going to challenge them? We all have a voice and we all need to use it. Otherwise, this will continue. It's going rampant. Just look at within the last three months, it's all over the country. It's worse here in Minnesota because it is. The powers that be are more the white than the black and they're very intimidating. When my son death got out and people wanted to tear up the north side, um, I said no to that because that was not what he was about. But the people in power here, our Don Samuelson, people that he had worked with, had nothing to say. They all backed off. Mr. Samuelson even told me, well, Miss Smith, if you sue the city, you'll be suing me. And I'm like, and? <laughs> So that's what we have to deal with when I say it's why we need more people behind us. We need to all talk, all protest, get it together, confront the people that we have put in power, because we put them there before it's your child. Because it's sure, I do believe that once it's finished with killing off as many black men as they can, they're black women. And eventually they will become whites who they don't think are up to their standards. So we've got to stop this now. It's gotten out of hand, but we are people, we voted, and we have a say, and we can get out and do what we need to do to stop it. And it will not stop unless we do it. 
the rules won't change unless we make them change. All right, next up we have Jess Sutton from the Anti-War Committee, and uh, she's going to be giving her perspective of the misuse of the grand jury, uh, the process in which they used to uh, persecute activists. Thank you, Lena, um, and I'm honored to be on this panel today, and especially Betty, thank you for sharing your story. Um, before I talk about grand juries, I'm going to go back to 1900 and um, share something from anti-lynching activist and journalist Ida B. Wells. She said this about lynchings, quote, it is not the creature of the hour, the sudden outburst of uncontrolled fury or the unspeakable brutality of an insane mob. It represents the cool, calculating deliberation of intelligent people who openly avow that there is an unwritten law that justifies them in putting human beings to death without complaint under oath, without trial by jury, without opportunity to make defense, and without right of appeal. She is saying that the racists who carried out those lynchings felt justified to act as judge, jury, and executioner of thousands of black people. And today, police killings of African Americans happen at least twice as often as lynchings did at their peak in this country in the time that Wells was speaking of. And today, killer cops also justify their actions as enforcing the law while denying their victims any justice, and they rest assured that the law will protect the police every time. So we're talking about grand juries today, and I was invited, no doubt, because of my own experience as a grand jury resistor, targeted for my anti-war activism and my communist politics. However, I could not, in good conscience, begin there. I wanted to begin by acknowledging the long history of state-sanctioned terrorism against the African-American people, it's as old as the history of this country, itself founded on land stolen from the native nations and built largely with the labor of stolen African lives. And I entered this conversation where we began, understanding that the laws and the legal system are designed to maintain the existing order of things, and also understanding that this is a nation founded on racist national oppression. Extrajudicial killings by police are a continuation of the kind of terrorism that lynchings were, aimed at maintaining a status quo of white supremacy. And with that understanding, I see grand juries as one small part of what upholds that system. We all know what happened in Ferguson, and then in Staten Island, and before that in Ohio. The grand juries did not indict the killer cops. I don't know if everyone knows this, but I know, and we've started to learn today, that grand juries operate as a one-sided kangaroo court run by prosecutors with no judge, no defense attorney. And in fact, grand juries indict almost in almost every case. And when I say in almost every, it's not like nine out of 10. In federal grand juries, over a period of years where 162,000 cases were brought before federal grand juries, 11 ended without indictments. Just one more time, 11 out of 162,000 thousand grand juries failed to indict. With that knowledge, we can only conclude that the government got what it wanted, no indictment, no justice. My own experience with the grand jury and my investigating myself and my political associates was quite different, but no more just. Grand juries have long been used to sil as a tool to silence and intimidate activists connected to many movements, the American Indian movement, the black liberation struggle, the Chicano Liberation Movement, Puerto Rican Independence Movement, Arab American and Muslim communities, anti-war activists, radical environmentalists, communists, anarchists, and any important social movement in our country's history. But how, how does a grand jury silence and intimidate activists? I wanna offer you one example, there are like so many, but I'm gonna just narrow it down to one, which is the example, the case of Dr. Abdel Ahalim Ashkar. He was acquitted of conspiracy charges related to organizations back in his home country in Palestine. But he refused to testify at a grand jury that was investigating the, the broader Palestinian community in Chicago. And because he refused to testify as a witness against his fellow community members, he was convicted of criminal contempt and sentenced to 11 years in prison. 
Palestinians, along with Arabs and Muslims, have been heavily targeted for state repression, and grand juries have allowed some leaders, like Dr. Ashkar, to be incarcerated, while stories like this strike fear throughout the community. When folks do testify, communities become divided by suspicion. What did they say about who? Can they be trusted anymore? The strategy, this strategy is like a witch hunt, and it has wrecked havoc in mosques and community centers across this country, devastating many communities, absolutely including our own Somali community here in Minnesota. Our case, my case, began with the government spying. An undercover agent had been spying on the anti-war committee, Freedom Road Socialist Organization, and every group that we worked with, starting with the Republican National Convention protests in 2008. It was more than two years later that the FBI raided my home and issued me a subpoena ordering me to testify before a grand jury in Chicago. That spy I mentioned, who went by the name Karen Sullivan, had keys to the anti-war committee office, passwords for the computer and the email, recordings of countless anti-war committee and Freedom Road coalition and coalition meetings and gatherings. It was a grand jury. If they wanted an indictment, they could have gotten it on her word alone, especially once combined the dozens of boxes of evidence collected from our homes and offices during the FBI raids. But they wanted more. They wanted us to cooperate in our own prosecution and to serve as witnesses against each other and our political associates across the U.S. and in places like Colombia and Palestine, where some of us have met activists who are targets of brutal U.S.-backed regimes. We refused to cooperate. And with a broad national circle of support, I guess I should have allowed for a dramatic pause, but I'm going to keep going. Um, the, but we had an amazing circle of support around us, and the government didn't jail us for refusing to testify. There's a few of my fellow grand jury resistors here, Tracy and Sarah. I don't think I missed anyone else today. Um, they didn't jail us like they had Dr. Ashkar. And just to be clear, we were very worried they would because it was the same prosecutor, same Chicago prosecutor, who imprisoned Dr. Ashkar for 11 years, held our fate in his hands too. The government today, to this day, says that our case remains open. In fact, we might have already been indicted with the government waiting to unseal charges at the time of their choosing. <coughs> or maybe they've dropped the case, but hope to hinder our work by holding the threat of prosecution over our heads indefinitely. Even if I am never charged, the grand jury has proved itself a dangerous enough by prompting the prosecution of some of the veteran activists closest to us. First, there was Carlos Montes, a Los Angeles-based leader of the Chicano movement. At the, initiative of FBI, the, at the initiative of FBI agents in our case, Carlos was brought up on state charges in California that were based on his activism as a young man in the Brown Berets 40 years ago, a target of the COINTEL Pro program of the FBI. But a flood of protest and support from across the country stopped that case in its tracks. We won his case two years ago, and Carlos is free today, running for LA City Council, as it happens. Um, I don't know if it's called City Council there. It might be called something else, but anyway. But then they came for Resmia Ode, and she's an icon of the Palestinian liberation movement. Prosecutors who were conducting our grand jury in Chicago passed her name to the U.S. attorneys in Detroit, which is where Rasmia had first entered the United States some 20 years ago. A survivor of torture at the hands of her Israeli captors in 1969, the U.S. government is now prosecuting Rasmia for supposed immigration fraud. She was convicted last month in Detroit. The government sought to imprison her right away until her sentencing, which isn't until March. But we refuse to accept that. We won her release on bond just last week. Today she's back home in Chicago, continuing her important work organizing with women's, immigrant women in Chicago until the sentencing and the appeal of her unjust conviction. Carlos and Rasmia are both incredible people who've dedicated their lives to struggling for the liberation of their peoples and combating the empire that holds us all down. Every victory we've had in our case or in either of their cases has grown out of the pressure that we've put on the justice system from the outside, from the streets. That is the way to any victory in the struggle against police brutality and police killing as well. We have to take our lead from the people of Ferguson, 
who refused to accept the bogus verdict in favor of that killer cop, Darren Wilson. And from the mother of Tamir Rice and the wife of Eric Garner, from all those, and from Betty Smith, and all those <clears throat> who refused to accept the legalized lynching of their loved ones by racist killer cops. We must uphold the rights of self-defense and self-determination and make our change in the streets. I believe we can turn this around. We will rewrite that unwritten law and win justice where it's been denied. We will jail the terrorists and torturers from the police departments to the military barracks, along with the generals and the politicians in charge of them. Together, we will fight and win freedom and liberation for all those oppressed, because black lives matter. Thank you, Jess. Next, we're going to hear from our uh, landlord here, Dave Vicky. Uh, and he's going to talk about how we're effectively uh, working to hold cops accountable. I hope our discussion could also really focus on what we can do to combat this problem. We've talked about it, and I think this is an a amazing moment where more and more people are aware that this is a systemic problem, that police brutality serves a real function in this country. In general, people have always, uh, general population people think, well, everybody's against police brutality and abuse of power. It's just we have different ideas about what to do about it. But I think people have pointed out here what is very important is that these serve real functions and serve the status quo and serve to keep the people in power in power. So um, with that, I, there's a fav favorite quote of mine that says, the philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. So I just want to talk about that briefly and hope we talk about that in our discussion. Um, I've been working for a long time with um, CUAPB, Communities United Against Police Brutality, which has sponsored and gotten this forum together and done so many other things over uh, 14 years. Um, this is a, a huge problem, obviously, and it's going to need some very big solutions. But there's also a lot of smaller pieces to this problem um, and that, that have uh, solutions as well that we can work toward. Um, CUAPB has been working for 14 years on the bigger problem, but also a lot of the things that we can tackle right here with people working together. So um, we have been working in uh, various areas. Political action, of course the demonstrations, pressure on um, elected officials, challenging the media. That's been an important part of our action. We've also um, worked in a legislative area, whether it's city council, state legislature, um, working for uh, policy changes that uh, may help with this problem. We've worked in education, um, know your rights training, cop watch training, uh, forums such as this. And we also work with the victims, or we call them survivors, in most cases, of police brutality, who uh, come to us. We have a 24-hour hotline, 612-874-STOP. Um, we have little hotline cards on the table there. I hope people will get those and, and give those to other people so that people know how to reach someone who can help. With cases such as those, we can offer referral to lawyers. We can go to court with people, help them understand um, what they what they can do, and um, you know just offer the personal support that people need in such a, a very difficult and stressful time. So there are, as I say, uh, it's a huge problem when you talk about grand juries, talk about just racism, our societal problems, the militarization of the police, the uses of the police for repression, um, and that can seem really overwhelming just an impossible, intractable problem. And a lot of people, are think, I think, are understandably caught up in that feeling that there's nothing we can do. This is too big for us, um, even working together. But there's a lot of changes that can be made, and some of those um, CUAPB has made some real progress on over the years. One of the things that's kept me motivated in this area, particularly working in Minneapolis, is that the Minneapolis Police Department is considerably worse than the typical police department for a city of our size and demographics. Um, not coincidentally, 
the city has some of the worst racial disparities in the country. I don't think that is a coincidence. Um, but because of that, while we see the problems in that, I also see the opportunity in that. We're facing huge societal problems which require, uh, frankly, I think, revolutionary solutions. But we also have a situation here. If we could make the changes so that Minneapolis were even an average city for racial disparities and police action, think of the difference that would make in so many people's lives. Whether it's the people here who are killed by police, whether it's people here who are harassed by police on a regular basis, whether it's people who can't get a job because they have an unfair arrest record, can't get housing because of that. The differences that we could make that are really concrete are, are something that motivates me and I hope will motivate other people and does motivate other people, I'm sure, to do the hard work from day to day of taking on some of these, uh, some of these possible solutions. Um, I think of some of the solutions um, both in preventing police brutality, preventing these killings, and the thing that's gotten much more attention lately is holding police accountable when they do kill. But in the end, the accountability, while it rightfully gets a whole lot of attention here because of the grand jury actions, that's what's led to the, the real action that we've seen in the streets. Um, the real purpose of accountability, or the most important purpose anyway, is prevention. You know, I mean, there's a certain amount of uh, revenge, whatever, <coughs> satisfaction. But in the end, we want to prevent these killings, prevent the um, records, uh, arrest records that people get that keep them out of good jobs, the whole thing. So uh, CUAPB has been working on that. Um, we came up with as a list of 31 things that the police, well, that the city council and the mayor in Minneapolis could do, concrete actions. We hear talk from them about racial equity. We hear talk about, oh, we're going to do this or that with the police, but most of it is still just talk or studies we're going to conduct. There are things they could do right now. If they were really serious about this, we already know what are many of the things that could be done to have a significant impact here in Minneapolis. I speak of Minneapolis because we've done this here. The same sort of thing can be done, and if we have the people to do it, to work up what could be done in the state legislature, what can be done in the courts, what can be done in the jails, what can be done in the schools. All of those are areas where we see the racism of the police in action and the terrible impact on people's lives. I'll just mention a few of those preventive things. Um, most of them I took from this list. Um, there's police policies, policies on use of taser, policy on use of dogs. There's a long, long list of things that could help. Um, you know, policies on tasers would have been an important part in, uh, in your unfortunate experience. Um, the uh, screening of police officers, testing uh, for use of steroids by police officers, the use of SWAT teams. This has gotten totally out of hand. And the screening of the people who are on the SWAT teams, and of course the drug war, which is what uh, motivates so many of those SWAT team raids. Um, the demilitarization of the police, giving back the weapons that the uh, federal government has basically given them. Um, getting more data, you know, there's still room for study, but data on things such as arrests that don't lead to prosecution, that are there more for harassment than they are for enforcement of any actual laws or criminal behavior. Um, an early warning system for the police, something which they're just starting up now, they say, but they said that for 20 years, and I've heard it over and over again, oh, we just started that, or we're about to start that, or so on. This goes on forever. Um, as far as the accountability, there are things that we can tackle, um, some of them not quite as big as trying to change the whole grand jury system. First of all, in investigations, officers should be treated the same as any other person. Right now, they're given 48 hours, generally a lot more than that, to meet together and get their stories straight. And it's real obvious that they're doing this. We're told that, oh, well, their recollections you know, five days afterwards have turned out to be far more accurate than their recollections right afterwards when they were under the stress <coughs> of the adrenaline rush. Well, they don't treat other people like that. 
You know, they don't let other people talk among themselves before they're questioned. Um, also, when we talk about independent prosecutions, it should be important that those are set up so they could be started immediately. Every so-called independent prosecution starts days afterwards, oftentimes weeks, when um, you know all of the important stuff, the crime scene, the original evidence taking, uh, the original interviews, have all been done by that police force, and the so-called independent investigator or prosecutor has little to work on except the evidence that is presented by the police force. Um, something as simple as not rotating office through the, through the internal affairs unit would be a major advance because now they know that they're gonna be back on the street in a year or two, partnered up with someone that they, well, in, in all cases, mm -hmm. didn't investigate properly. Um, so these are things that we can work on that CUAPB is working on um, and that with more people, more resources, the more we can do. And I don't want to just say CUAPB, there's other groups, of course, who are working on this. Nationally, there's a lot of groups that, uh, that uh, Peter mentioned are very important. Um, there's a couple things we have tried. Um, civilian review authorities is an area that was really an important reform won by people starting back about 20 years ago, actually a little over 20 years ago in this city. And um, those were the results of some major struggles. Um, this is not something that uh, mayors and police departments just decided would be a real good idea. Every civilian review authority in this country results from a riot or the imminent threat of a riot. Uh, it's no coincidence that we're talking about this now and this has become a major national issue after a rebellion in the streets of Ferguson. This is an important time as a result. Unfortunately, those <coughs> reforms were still controlled by the people in power who were trying to maintain their power, and they were very weak. In this city, um, two years ago, they actually got rid of the Civilian Review Authority, which was pretty toothless because it didn't have the investigators that it needed, and the chief could still make the final decision on discipline. But we've wound up with something even worse than that, which is being touted as civilian involvement in police investigations and is not anything of the sort. Um, again, CUAPB has done an analysis of that. We have a piece of paper on the table in the back I invite you to take that gives some of the statistics that shows just how bad this is. And we know this is bad intentionally. Um, body cameras is another thing that's been a huge discussion. Uh, they have some pluses in terms of getting some more information, but there's also some significant problems with them. And without going into a long discussion, I think it's important to realize that you know, the national emphasis on body cameras is coming primarily from people who want to appear to be doing something rather than making the actual changes that are needed. That, that brings me to the um, National Commission or Task Force that Obama has set up. And one of the things we need to do is act nationally because we need to get in front of that. Rather than have them come up with um, suggestions that are useless or probably worse than useless, we need to do that. Um, uh, Communities United Against Police Brutality is initiating a conversation nationwide informing some kind of similar group of real activists, people with real knowledge, who can get out in front of that and talk about what's really needed and show how <coughs> hypocritical and uh, useless this uh, national task force is going to be. Finally, um, I want to talk very briefly. Um, there's been so many things that have been tried in the past, and most of them depend upon the police to police themselves or the goodwill of our elected officials. Um, as Communities United Against Police Brutality has initiated a plan for police officers to have their own individual liability insurance. Yes. This means, thank you, yes. This would result in some personal responsibility for the police officer, as there is for most professionals. Um, it also 
gets around relying on the police to discipline the police because insurance companies have some interests that maybe the mayor and the city council members don't, mm -hmm. and that is their own money. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that is the big motivator in, in making changes. So officers who, you know, have frequent misconduct, frequent <coughs> complaints, would wind up having an increase in their insurance premiums, which I, I'll tell you, there's some uh, police officers on the Minneapolis force who could never assured in, uh, afford insurance and probably would never even be offered it. And that would be an immediate solution to some of the problems. Again, we don't want to rely on politicians, or I should say we can't rely on politicians. So we are petitioning right now to get this on the ballot as a charter change for Minneapolis. It has the wonderful advantage also, as I say, just as the program itself, the beauty of it is because of a charter change, if we get enough signatures, they have to put it on the ballot we don't have to have a single city council member in favor if we don't, you know. And if it, and if it wins, it goes into the city charter. So um, it's another way to get an end run around the powers that be, that as people have been talking here, are the real folks who are responsible for the continuing problems of racism and police brutality in this country. Thank you. Well, now you know the conversation's going to get real. <laughs> I'm angry. This is the part where you hear from the angry black woman. Uh -oh. Because every single day that I step outside my front door, I'm targeted by police. Every single day when I'm pulled over by Officer Friendly, he's Officer, I won't say what he is. But immediately, I am profiled. I become a criminal. And we have to do more than just march and petition. Those are great starts, but I consider everybody in this room an ally to the cause of Black Lives Matter. And it's going to take Caucasian people to not only stand in solidarity, but it's going to take you going to the Capitol with me, offering this type of legislation. Because let me tell you folks, we need it more than just a city charter. We have to change the law. I want equal protection under the law equal protection under the law. And I'm not getting it now. And black men are not getting that now. And black children are not getting that now. And I want it now. So it's gonna take more. We're gonna to have to become organized. And it's gonna take more than protests and petitions. We're gonna to have to go in droves to the state capitol. Because these people that we elected, who we keep electing over and over again, they don't care about our plight. They don't care that there's tens of thousands of us who are being murdered in the streets. All they care about is state-funded money for them to line their pockets with. So we need to go to the Capitol in droves, and we need to make them author legislation that requires body cameras, that requires liability insurance, that requires that after so many disciplinary actions, you lose your job, because that's what happens to me when I don't perform and when I don't meet expectations.